Greetings and salutations. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get into some history today. Let me just say it frankly up front, and that is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a.k.a. FDR, the president who served, and I use that term maybe incorrectly right now, but who ruled the United States regime longer than any other president, and there were constitutional restraints put in so that no one else will do it until those restraints are removed, was a bloodthirsty murderer. I'll say it again. FDR is a bloodthirsty murderer. What I'm saying is relatively inflammatory. What I say is as a proud American, and I plan to present a short narrative along with some facts, including a primary source, to show some of his devilishness. And ultimately, you all are going to have to peel back the layers of time, the layers of history, and the layers of primary sources to figure out if what I'm saying is a phony or if FDR is a phony. He is aggrandized mostly in these government systems of schooling, and he's aggrandized by people like AOC and Barack Obama and others nowadays. And it's always terrifying to me. I want to tell you one of my first experiences with FDR is that when I was in fourth grade, I was in a magnet program at Kester Magnet Elementary on the border of Van Nuys and Sherman Oaks in the northern end of Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley. And my teacher in my fourth grade magnet class was named Mrs. Inouye. When Mrs. Inouye was a young girl, so again, it's not that many generations removed, although World War II may seem like a long time ago, she was a Japanese-American, an American born and raised in America, but of Japanese descent. And she was one of the many little girls that were forced, in fact, 100,000 Japanese who were put in concentration camps by FDR, who were interned and who were abused by their own regime because of skepticism that the regime had over these, I don't know, double agents that they thought, or at least potential double agents that would feel some type of way about the United States aggression towards Japan. Now, was Imperial Japan some sort of paradise? No. But the point is, a lot of people in the culture that I grew up in, I think, will blindly have hero worship over FDR and are less likely to be able to empathize with the Japanese. I've always appreciated Japanese manga, Japanese anime, Japanese jujitsu, right? The martial art that I practice, uh, Japanese film, so many things I love about Japan. That doesn't make me an apologist for the Japanese. I'm not Japanese in any form, shape, or way in terms of my blood or, or anything like that. But what I am is somebody who tries to zoom out, who tries to step out of his context, to tries to step out of his biases, and to try to get a picture for what history would look like if I was objective, if I was neutral. I know that it's almost impossible for me to be fully objective or fully neutral, but I know that I could strive for that. And part of that is doing an all out assault on my biases by trying to hear history from as many different point of views as possible. The great Dan Carlin is one of those people, not to be confused for the comedian George Carlin. Dan Carlin is a radio man who found himself and fancied himself a student of history. And he began this series called Hardcore History, which some of you may already be fans of. If you're not, I'm going to link to it and I suggest you check out his programs. He does things on the uh, the Huns, you know, the Mongolians. He does things on Western history and Christianity, and he does things on the East. And so he has a program called Supernova in the East. And I listened to part one, which is like four hours or something long, a couple years ago, maybe a few years ago. And just recently, I'm almost done doing a similar length listen through of part two of the Supernova series. I think as of right now, there of, of this recording, there are about four recordings he has that are each about four hours in length. So it's as if it's its own kind of long audio book on Japan and on World War II era stuff. Supernova in the East was more about what was going on in the Philippines. And he introduced this idea that some people have used in reference to Jewish people and their ability to remain distinct over the ages and across multiple places. And he, he applied that to the Japanese. He says they're like everyone else except a little more intense. And what he meant by that is the, the hyper-nationalism, the distinction of the culture, and the, the way in which some of the higher-ups, as well as even some of the foot soldiers, behaved was very unique given world history. And he thought that that was worth highlighting. 
So anyway, in Supernova in the East Part 2, which I'm close to finishing, he references the historian Francis Pike and the historian Charles Beard, and especially Francis Pike talking about Charles Beard. Charles Beard is a phenomenal left historian that I learned about years ago when I read Why American History is Not What They Say, An Introduction to Revisionism by the great Jeff Riggenbach. You can find the whole PDF of Why American History is Not What They Say on Mises.org for free, or you can purchase a paperback copy so that your tactile senses can feel it and you remember what's in it more, but also so that you could support the Mises Institute and all of the great work they do in providing all of these economic texts and historic texts for free in the sake uh, for the sake of liberty. And one of the greatest threats to liberty, of course, is war, which Ralph, uh, which Randolph Bourne referred to as the health of the state. So. Jeff Riggenbach put me on to Charles Beard, Charles A. Beard, years ago, and his wife, Mary Beard, who they co-authored many books that made themselves a pariah because they refused to be court historians. They refused to be court jesters, and they told things as they saw it, which is what they, th they thought they called it as it was, which is as they saw it or as they perceived it. And so without being an apologetic, without trying to prepare a defense for the regime and its warmongering and its bloodthirst. Instead, he just tried painting the picture for what it was. And what Charles Beard was, according to Jeff Riggenbach and according to Francis Pike and according to Dan Carlin, uh, is somebody who showed FDR intentionally went into the war with the Germans uh, who were the Nazis, and with the Imperial Japan, who were allied in the Axis also with fascist Italy. So. As an Ethiopian, obviously I'm going to be against fascist Italy and everyone and their mom is against the Nazis. So we don't need to rehash arguments against fascist Italy right now, nor do we need to rehash arguments against the Nazis. Imperial Japan also, I said, the Shogun is not somebody who I'm necessarily a fan of. I've always been interested with the character of the Ronin who is usually oppressed by the sh by the shogun in the Japanese manga and anime and the ronin is the samurai who has ran out of his um his master in fact the most recent movie of that type that i had consumed is shogun assassin with the rizza the rapper from the wu-tang clan really the mind of the wu-tang clan preparing these live commentaries and film shows on on the weekends with his 36 chambers cinema i was able to watch shogun assassin recently and the whole premise of Shogun Assassin is that the Shogun is messed up and the Shogun was afraid of his number one assassin. So he tries to assassinate his, his own assassin and that ends up being a bad move. And you can go watch the movie Shogun Assassin to see more of what it is that I'm talking about. But anyway, that is an aside, that is a digression. And Charles Beard with his book, President Roosevelt and the Coming of the War, uh, 1941, and with his earlier books, basically said eight years in advance prophetically that Roosevelt would look for some sort of incident to provoke war with the Japanese and with the Germans. At the time, Dan Carlin says this in a series, the American public was polling at 95% against the war. They were non-interventionists, to use the language of, of Ron Paul and of the original Senator Taft and of... Um, uh, Oh my God, it's, his name is slipping me now, but one of the richest people on earth uh, makes money off the death tax slash the state tax. In any event, I'll think of it later. His father was one of these people considered on the old right, but sometimes the old right and the left follow the shoe the shoe horse, uh, the horseshoe theory, and they end up being on the same side. That's the point that Jeff Riggenbach makes in his uh, book is that people on the so-called old right, people of the new left, and people who consider themselves libertarians, various revisionist historians, Tom Woods, Tom DiLorenzo, William Appleman Williams, Gore Vidal, Charles A. Beard, and Howard Zinn all ended up, even though they had various political ideologies on the domestic front, agreeing that in the foreign policy, the US in colonialism, imperialism, or warmongering, however you want to refer to it, is wrong. And a lot of them, but especially Charles A. Beard, were against Roosevelt, who they believed was too timing, who believed intentionally would lie about his stances because he knew that 95% of America was anti-war. 95% of America was peacenik, what some people pejoratively would refer to as isolationist. And so 
George Carlin reads from a little bit of a speech called the Quarantine Speech. It was a speech given on October 5th, 1937 by Roosevelt. I want you to know that sometimes people, even Dan Carlin and others, think that it's conspiratorial to say that Roosevelt would have wanted the war and baited the Japanese into getting into war. But one, remember the 100,000 Japanese that he interned. I've visited the Japanese American Museum in Little Tokyo in downtown Los Angeles, and I encourage you to go visit it. It's very brutal, and you could see a lot of the history documented there. So let some of that color the narrative. Another thing that I want you to keep in perspective is that a lot of times people have sanitized I say the sanitized versions of war that they would not classify as war, and that's the economic stuff. So Roosevelt intentionally did things like a blockade, intentionally did things like economic sanctions on Japan, and Japan being a tiny island nation, it would bring them to the point of starvation. It would bring them to the point of being cornered. And when you corner any animal, and human beings are animals, when you corner any animal, the result is that they are going to strike back. They are going to do something. And so it's not that FDR is innocent by any means. The only question is whether you think he was trying his best to be charitable in the least warlike things that are still war, or if you think he was intentionally turning up the heat and turn intentionally, gradually, and incrementally preparing the war drums to be beaten so that he could swindle and hornswoggle the American people into getting them into a war to distract them from the depression that he elongated with his horrible economic policies of the New Deal. So anyway, 1776 was a conspiracy. The Constitutional Convention was a conspiracy. These are ideas from Michael Malice who's the new right I just recently reviewed on this channel. The Gulf of Tonkin was also a conspiracy. I learned about that first from a mortal technique. So realize that major events in the history of the United States are well-known, well-documented to be conspiracies. They're not conspiracy theories. They're conspiracy facts. And I would say that FDR entering the United States into World War II was itself a conspiracy fact. And I stand with Jeanette Rankin, the great woman who stood against both World War I and World War II as the lone voice in the House of Representatives or the Senate. Uh, anyway, she was in Congress and she was the lone voice. So shout out to Jeanette Rankin for saying no to World War I and no to World War II. I think there's something to the biological difference between women and men and the conviction that she had is very interesting. I've never seen millions of women go to war with millions of women. It's typically men who do that. And that's something for you all to reflect on. Anyway, I'm gonna read this speech by Roosevelt. And I want you to think about the subterfuge and the planning that he has. He presents himself as this peace candidate, just as George W. Bush did in 2000 and 2001 prior to 9-11. And then when 9-11 happened, he used the crisis to go for what he really wanted, was to go get a lick back for his daddy in Iraq. Forget the Afghanistan stuff, which some people try to justify with the AUMF, the authorization to use military force, but definitely Iraq 2 and Iraq 3 were unnecessary and they were sold in the same pretenses. History repeats itself. So here's October 5th, 1937, the quarantine speech by FDR. One more point that's uh, relevant. This is in 1937, just a couple decades after the Spanish flu. We're in the midst of our own pandemic right now. So the language of quarantine is not new to 2020. And the language of quarantine is what he used. And it's one of the things that you see genocidal people use before they commit a genocide. They dehumanize their opponents or their adversaries, or at least the human beings that they perceive to be their their adversaries, they view them as parasites, they view them as diseases, and they try to rid them out. So notice his language. He's referencing the Spanish flu as something that is the equivalent of the Japanese people in Imperial Japan. And you might best case scenario argue he's only talking about the regime and the people in charge. But ultimately, when you see the bombs dropped, which were mm, the results of the baby steps walked by FDR, you wonder how culpable that man was. So here we go. I am glad to come once again to Chicago 
and especially to have the opportunity of taking part in the dedication of this important project of civic betterment. On my trip across the continent and back, I have been shown many evidences of the result of common sense cooperation between municipalities and the federal government. And I have been greeted by tens of thousands of Americans who have told me in every look and word that their material and spiritual well being has made great strides forward in the past few years. And yet, as I have seen with my own eyes, the prosperous farms, the thriving factories, and the busy railroads, as I have seen the happiness and security and peace which covers our wide land, almost inevitably, I have been compelled to contrast our peace with the very different scenes being enacted in other parts of the world. It is because the people of the United States, under modern conditions, must, for the sake of their own future, give thought to the rest of the world, that I, as the responsible executive head of the nation, have chosen this great inland city and this gala occasion to speak to you on a subject of definite national importance. The political situation in the world, which of late has been growing progressively worse, is such as to cause grave concern and anxiety to all the peoples and nations who wish to live in peace and amity with their neighbors. Some 15 years ago, the hopes of mankind for a continuing era of international peace were raised to great heights when more than 60 nations solemnly pledged themselves not to resort to arms in furtherance of their national aims and policies. The high aspirations expressed in the Bryant Kellogg Peace Pact and the hopes for peace thus raised have of late given way to a haunting fear of calamity. The present reign of terror and international lawlessness began a few years ago. It began through unjustified interference in the internal affairs of other nations or the invasion of alien territory in violation of treaties and has now reached a stage where the very foundations of civilization are seriously threatened. The landmarks and traditions which have marked their progress of civilization toward a condition of law, order, and justice are being wiped away without a declaration of war and without warning or justification of any kind. Civilians, including vast numbers of women and children, are being ruthlessly murdered with bombs from the air. In times of so-called peace, ships are being attacked and sunk by submarines without cause or notice. Nations are fomenting and taking sides in civil warfare in nations that have never done them in any that have never done them any harm. Nations claiming freedom for themselves deny it to others. Innocent peoples, innocent nations are being cruelly sacrificed to a greed for power and supremacy which is devoid of all sense of justice and humane considerations. To paraphrase a recent author, Perhaps we foresee a time when men, exultant in the technique of homicide, will rage so hotly over the world that every precious thing will be in danger, every book and picture and harmony, every treasure garnered through two millenniums sick, the small, the delicate, the defenseless, all will be lost or wrecked or utterly destroyed. If those things come to pass in other parts of the world, let no one imagine that America will escape, that America may expect mercy that this Western Hemisphere will not be attacked and that it will continue tranquilly and peacefully to carry on the ethics and the arts of civilization. If those days come, there will be no safety by arms, no help from authority, no answer in science. The storm will rage till every flower of culture is trampled and all human beings are leveled in a vast chaos. If those days are not to come to pass, if we are to have a world in which we can breathe freely and live in amity without fear, Year, the peace-loving nations must make a concerted effort to uphold laws and principles on which alone peace can rest secure. The peace-loving nations must make a concerted effort in opposition to those violations of treaties and those ignorings of humane instincts, which today are creating a state of international anarchy and instability from which there is no escape through mere isolation or neutrality, those who cherish their freedom and recognize and respect the equal right of their neighbors to be free and live in peace must work together for the triumph of law and moral principles in order that peace, justice, and confidence may prevail in the world. There must be a return to a belief in the pledged word, in the value of a signed treaty. There must be recognition of the fact that national morality is as vital 
as private morality. A bishop wrote me the other day, it seems to me that something greatly needs to be said in behalf of ordinary humanity against the present practice of carrying the horrors of war to helpless civilians, especially women and children. It may be that such a protest might be regarded by many who claim to be realist as futile, but may it not be that the heart of mankind is so filled with horror at the present needless suffering that the force could be mobilized in sufficient volume to lessen such cruelty in the days ahead. Even though it may take 20 years, which God forbid, for civilization to make effective its corporate protest against this barbarism, surely strong voices may hasten the day. There is a solidarity and interdependence interdependence about the modern world, both technically and morally, which makes it impossible for any nation completely to isolate itself from economic and political upheavals in the rest of the world, especially when such upheavals appear to be spreading and not declining. Okay, that's enough for now. I'm going to stop reading the speech, but I will link to it. And I want you to remember, read what FDR says. Read what Charles Beard says. Read what Jeff Rickenbach says. And listen to Dan Carlin.